the abduction subject phenomenon is the central part of the whole UFO phenomenon. You know, it's not just nuts and bolts and lights in the sky. It's affecting people's lives. Toward that end, may I ask you, um, because you've had more than enough time to have a very good overview of what what, uh, people are dealing with. So I wonder if you can give us a breakdown of the types of uh, alien beings that people encounter. I mean, how many different ones are there? We talk about the greys. There's different types of greys. Mm-hmm. There's, I don't know, do you deal with reptilian yes. type beings? you deal with mantid type beings? you deal with human beings? What, what actually is the breakdown of what people are experiencing? Oh, gosh. Um, yeah, it's really all of the above. Um, you know, we, we all know now about the little guys, little gray guys, four foot tall maybe, or the ones that are usually the abductors who take the person out of their normal environment. But then as I was working with cases, um, people who don't know each other all describe once they got onto the craft, they saw taller beings that looked like the little gray beings, but they were taller. Some had uh, uniforms on um, Mm -hmm. that they describe very tight-fitting uniforms. Then there were the, um, the praying mantis is, seems to be always there, and he seems to be in charge. And very often, he's not touching the person. He's not performing any of the experiments, but he stands aside, like in, a, you know, in the mm-hmm. side of the room, side of the table, and it's almost like he's giving direction. And as we know, they they communicate uh, telepathically. So, uh, but he seems to be always there. And I always say he because it always seems to be a male praying Interesting. mantis. Okay. Um, then there's the the very tall um, female type being who wears a long white gown. Uh, often she comes in and she will soothe and calm down the person. But, you know, there's, so there's these tall beings, tall white beings. Um, there's the... Now, wait. So tall uh, white, are they human-looking mm-hmm. beings? Or are they something else? They're, no. No. They're, um, they're, they look very alien, you know, okay. the face, but very tall. Um and this one is funny because I get this from just about every case. The person will say, someone else just came in, and um, it's a female. Often, though, it's not always the tall white one, but another being will come in, will look like the other taller gray beings, but it's a, but she has a female energy to her. They say, you know, she doesn't look any different from the others, but she, I know she's female. She seems to be the one to come in and sue the person. Okay. But then there's another type that comes in that the abductee recognizes from very early childhood. And it's that being that's been with this person throughout their entire life. Okay. They're not afraid of this person. It's very familiar. It's almost like family, and they become very emotional about it. Now, these tall white beings, I know I read a few years ago that I met Charles Hall. I don't know if you interviewed him at all, but he talked about coming across these tall white beings in the Nevada desert when he was in the military. I thought that was very interesting, but Mm -hmm. I believe he said they looked alien. That's but, my understanding. Yeah. I'm sorry? That is my understanding as well. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, it's been a few years since I've spoken to him. But um, then there's the reptilian. The reptilians are there. But I don't seem to come across the reptilians or my clients who are describing their experience as much as the other beings that I mentioned. And then definitely the very human-looking beings, which we feel are... Um, are the hybrids, are the perfected hybrids. Mm-hmm. So you're, you're the people that you <clears throat> regress do to some extent describe all of those types to a greater or lesser mm-hmm. extent? 
Yeah, and they all seem to be working together many times. They're on the ship, right. then all these different types are there. <clears throat> but it's the taller grays that are the seem to be the ones that are performing all the medical experiments and uh, procedures. I recently um, uh, chatted with uh, Dr. Jacobs about his research mm-hmm. and his conclusions, and um, it seems to me what you're describing is is pretty much in line with his observations that he's gotten through the regressions that he's done and, uh, you know, the different types of beings. He also has concluded that the mantid beings are the ones uh, in charge. They seem to be running the show. Uh, And he goes, he further concludes, at least this is his opinion, that the mantids are really the ones that actually created the various types of greys through, um, you know, as worker species for them and... I mean, I don't know if, if you've really gone down to that type of conclusion. Do you have any opinions on that sort of scenario? That he's, David's saying that they, he feels the mantis are created. Yeah, the, right. That they're, the small. his, his, uh, this is really his hunch or his assessment, I guess mm-hmm. we could say, that uh, the greys were, are worker uh, species created essentially by the praying mantid. Uh, type beings that, in his opinion, are mm-hmm. actually running it. His opinion, incidentally, he, he bases it on the fact that they, the mantid, seem least like us, like human beings, um, morphologically or anatomically, and mm-hmm. that uh, he therefore thinks that the the greys are actually some kind of alien human hybrid that they're they're created with a a certain amount of um, of our DNA, but um, but they're they're a completely worker species. Yeah, I I feel that, and I know that I've heard other people, experiencers talk about that, yeah. that they, they're very, the small ones yeah. that take the people, they're very high mentality t- type, and, you know, they, they always say there's no emotion or anything to them, right. so, you know, that does make sense to me. The very human question, you know, that we always want to know, is it good, or is it bad, is it, you know, evil, um, I tell people... You know, they're not, it's neither. They're not, I don't get that they're evil, but they do have an agenda that they've been carrying out for a very long time. And I feel after doing all of my work is that the um, hybridization program is very central to this whole thing, to Mm -hmm. to their whatever their agenda is. And we, none of us know what the end game is. You know, we don't know. We it, It's all speculation. I don't think it's one or the other, Richard. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't I don't think they're just evil. I mean, yes, what they do, how they perform um, all of their, you know, their functions are, it, where they, they're taking people basically against their will because people don't know what's what's happening to them especially way back in childhood, because it's usually because of childhood, and they're made to forget their experiences. Mm-hmm. They don't, they're not that effective if someone like me can get into their, you know, subconscious and start pulling up the information. I don't think that they're meant to, I, in a way, I think they want us to know what's happening. They want people to be aware of what's happening to them. They definitely are concerned about how we're treating our environment and they've been giving messages for all the years I've been in this field to experiencers about how we need to clean up our act basically. Well, this might be a good chance to talk about your book chosen because this Mm -hmm. is a theme I'm I'm holding it in my hand and I'm sorry to interrupt you again. Uh, You you co-authored this book. It's called chosen with James P. Lau uh, subtitled from the alien hybrid program to the fate of the planet. And in this book, I mean, this is a very important theme I've discovered, which is that a lot of these uh, people that you've regressed have this uh, message that they're getting from these these uh, other beings, and, and it concerns the fate of the, the planet. Yes. Yes, and I, was, I just watched a news report last night. I should have recorded it, but if the scientists are basically saying that we are – that our, our situation – with the planet, with the warming of uh, that, our that our oceans are becoming warmer than they've ever have before. 
that in our Antarctica, the glaciers are melting at a very high rate of speed, which is going to raise the ocean levels. I mean, I'm watching this, Richard. I've been watching the news about this, and I'm thinking, oh, my God, is this what the experiencers are feeling or sensing or being told? Because it's alarming to me, Richard, because I'm listening to people one-on-one in very private sessions. And then what they're saying, they have no idea that I've heard it from several other people who they don't even know. That's why I felt an urgency. I called it the urgency, but I felt an urgency. that Mm -hmm. I spoke with Jim about it, Jim Lowe, my co-author, because he's an experiencer. He is going to be retiring from his law practice soon because he feels an urgency to do the work in that he's supposed to do in the UFO field which is amazing to me because I've heard that from many other people, that their present occupations aren't important anymore. I mean, I have people who've had, who, who make six figures, Richard, mm-hmm. you know, live in Beverly Hills here in Southern California or Bel Air. And I had a couple of them, they don't know each other, but both of them told me that they feel that they're not doing enough for the planet, that their work isn't important anymore. That the money is, you know, it's been nice, but it's not that important anymore. And I find that to be so amazing. And it's mm-hmm. some, it's pointing to something. But you're in, indicating you know, and, that they're getting these messages from these other beings. I yes, yeah, yes, they're doing clandestine taking of people, of examinations, of taking our DNA and all of that, mm-hmm. and may and creating a hybrid race. That, to me, is that's definite. People have all said they've seen these very strange babies. They're taken up several times to meet their hybrid children. They're told they have to bond with these children. Now, what is the ultimate goal? What's the end game for these children? I know David has his own theories about that, because you know, I right. read his book, um, is it aliens among us? Well, walk, walking among us. Walking among us, yeah. right? And that's you know a little unnerving. And maybe I want to just stay positive. P- about putting it mildly, yes, <laughs> it's unnerving. Yeah, mildly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I don't, and I don't want to dwell on on that. I'm hoping that this hybrid race will be, and I think they are here already. But living among us mm-hmm. for whatever reason, people have told me that they feel that they have come across a hybrid here, walking among us, where you would walk right by them and you wouldn't even think anything of it. But you stop and talk about talk to this person, and there's something very different about them. One of them said, "I, I feel like he was reading my mind; like he could look right through right. me." It was something very different. I've heard this myself, and I, I'm not even focusing on abduction research, but I've definitely mm-hmm. come across those stories. I wonder about a few things here that you've, you know, you're, you're touching on. A, the nature of these other beings. Like when I read some literature, it's as though these beings have no emotional empathy whatsoever. They have no creativity. They have no art. And then when when I come across other accounts. It's as if they're just all loving and they only care about us. And the disconnect for me is, is extreme. And I just, I, I find myself mm-hmm. really wondering what is actually the truth on this matter. Um, I don't know if you can answer that, but I'll ask you a different, well, you probably can answer. There's one other question <laughs> that comes to mind about the hybrids. And mm-hmm. this is a more kind of a matter of fact question. And I'm curious if in your research, you've had evidence that the hybrids are are created only on the craft, which is what when you hear David uh, talk about this, that is his assessment. Or there are other um, other people who conclude that the hybrids actually are born often into human families and then discover along the way that they are alien human hybrids, and that that's a completely different scenario because in the one. Uh, they're raised in a non-human environment without any human social skills. And mm-hmm. so this is why like, when you read Walking Among Us, they, the hybrids that people claim to encounter, I mean, they, they're 
utterly incapable of any kind of normal social interaction, it seems to me. Uh, but they right. learn they learn quickly because they're telepathic. And so they're basically like sociopaths, psychopaths, faking their way through everything. Uh, <laughs> but then, I mean, that's really how it is. And then, but then you have the other yeah. type description where they're born into a human family. And so they, they grow up with normal emotional responses and you can, and you can deal with them because they've been acculturated and, and, and they're psychologically kind of normal. So what is the deal? Like, are the hybrids born on the craft? Are they born here on, with human families? I mean, do you, do you have any hints in your own research with your folks? Yes, um, I think it's it's been both. You do, um, believe it or not. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, yes, I mean the, and I think it was my first book I've chosen, and I think I've it was the same cases I have in my new book chosen. But there've been accounts with women who were taken aboard and they were implanted there with a fetus or. Mm-hmm. The, Half, half human, half alien, and then subsequently they're abducted again, and something is removed from them. I mean, they're describing something being pulled out of them. So th- I think that that happens, of course, on the craft. And then the people have described. I even use it in my. I have visuals, you know, for in my lecture where people are describing men and women of of hundreds of tanks with these little strange beings uh, in this in this liquid. And, you know, this is, I've, I've heard this so many times. So something is happening, of course, on the craft. Is there any um, scenario in which that doesn't sound creepy as hell? Like, that is the ultimate creepy. I mean, uh, <laughs> there's yeah. just no good picture uh, yeah. I can, there's no good way to put that, it seems to me. Yeah. No, it's it's like you know, and it's so hard to talk about this. That's not what I'm doing, you know. And back in the day when I was doing a lot of uh, talk shows, I, I did want to approach this because, as far as the hybrids, because that's way beyond. People aren't even looking up in the sky thinking there's anything strange flying around, and then much less they're going to think about what are they going to think about women are being impregnated and having these half alien, half human babies. It's so sensational. I wanted. I always wanted to stay away from that. But yes, it's very creepy. I mean, to think that they're being created and they're in these tanks or cylinders until they're able to function on their own. But then over the years, um, and it seems like the past maybe 10, 15 years, something like this, I started mm-hmm. uh, working with women who have felt that, and men too, I mean the fathers have felt that they were abducted, the women were abducted, their wives, and the um, the fetus was manipulated, the diadane was manipulated while they were being abducted, and this was their human baby, so they tweaked them in a certain way. Oh, that's interesting. Um, mm Mm-hmm. And here they, you know, babies, like some of the babies are born very, it's like, oh my God, he seems to be very advanced. You know, they're very intelligent, very psychic. Um, and maybe that's what some people refer to as the star children or indigo children. Or right. I think it's all the same, to tell you the truth. I, this... I don't know why we put labels on on things, but... Um, Just a way to brand a like, new book. From all that. Can I ask you? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so this information about because um, this is a new interesting twist so someone mm-hmm. would be pregnant human mother human father and then it would come out I'm assuming this would be through um, a memory unpacked through hypnosis that they would remember an abduction experience while pregnant and recall this procedure right. that's right. that's how this yes. comes out yes and it, it has you know yeah. and I didn't hear I didn't hear this and like during my research and all what was coming out in the regression from the very beginning when I started doing this mm-hmm. but like I said like maybe the past maybe 15 years or so and I thought oh my god you know they're manipulating the pregnancy and um, the babies come out normal looking but they're 
advanced. I know several people said, oh, he's walking before my other one did, or, you know, they're talking. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just, and it may not be anything. I mean, it may just be, you know, that's, that's that child. But, you know, these mothers, these parents are definitely experiencers. Okay. So, and I could only go, I could only talk about where the research has been taking me. Right. And when you hear, if I just heard it once or twice, I, I thought, okay, no, I got to put it on the back burner. But when I hear it over and over again, that's when I know, okay, you know, something is up here. You know, they're doing something here. You mentioned earlier about the people who said, oh, you know, they're here to help us. I've had nothing but positive experiences. Right. You know, and I've heard that over the years in, in some of these conferences. And, you know, I don't take that away from people, of course, but... I feel very strongly that everyone who has had this experience, whether they say it's, you know, with positive or they were traumatized or whatever, and the ones that are saying that they're very positive, I've spoken to many of them, that they, they also have undergone the examinations and experiments that everyone else has gone through. That they just they blocked it, or you know they're just relying okay. on their conscious memories, because I, unless we're you know, again, I mean it's a speculation because they're not telling me anything, but it could be a completely different group that I'm not dealing with, of course, because people will come to me because they're traumatized. They don't come to me when they're totally happy, you know. Yeah. So it's so oh gosh this. Um, work is so difficult because, you know, I, like everyone else, want definite answers, and I can only go according to when I'm interviewing people, when I'm working, you know, one-on-one with people. Um, But what I don't like is when I hear a person who claims to have nothing but positive experiences to tell another person, oh, you know, don't be traumatized. You know, you'll you'll get over that, yeah. and they're wonderful. You'll see, and you know, I it just in during my my support group meetings, I don't allow that because everyone's at a different level with this. We all handle trauma differently. We all grieve differently. You know, everybody has to have their opportunity to work through this. But I've never stated that abduction experiences are po- all positive. Yeah, it's not about fear mongering, it's about it's about truth, right? I mean, it's about it's um, about, it's about it's getting about to the truth. It's about where the research is taking me. It's about what these people experiencers are experiencing within their um, hypnotic regression and going through the the fear and the trauma again since they were children. Now, I can't ignore that, Richard. You know, I can't ignore right. what people are describing going through when they're lying on the table and they can't move. I'm not saying, like I said, I, 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 do, I did say, I don't think they're evil, but they're carrying on an agenda. And I can't, I can't spout, I can't say, um, because I, I feel res- I have a responsibility to these hundreds, thousands of experiences that I've worked with, that um, I have to take a stance where, well, no, they're, you know, this is not all positive. Mm-hmm. Then I'm disregarding the people who are having PTSD. That doesn't make sense. I'm a hypnotherapist. Yeah. I mean, that's my job is to work with them to relieve that PTSD. But I'd sure like to know where this all is going to go, where are all these hybrids, what are they all going to do here on Earth? I don't feel or maybe I don't want to feel or think that it's going to be invasion of the body snatchers type scenario. Uh, sounds like you've um, wondered. I certainly, I certainly hope not, <laughs> you know, really, because, you know, oh, my gosh, I mean, we, we, you think about the millions of people involved in this. I mean, worldwide, you know, you've traveled. Mm-hmm. You know, when I travel, I get people from everywhere not not speaking English, and, and something resonates with them, and they're explaining the same type of experience that we have here in the United States, and they're doing it through an interpreter. So yeah. I was just amazed at what I was hearing. It is, we're dealing with something that's so elusive, and 
I mean, I guess it's it's got to be frustrating uh, for you, even after all these years. Like you're you've delved so deeply into this, and I know there are still questions that remain as to what mm-hmm. exactly are we dealing with. But I will just be honest with you. I don't really see um, this. I don't see a lot of love and light in the mm-hmm. phenomenon coming from these other beings. Um, m- my own take has, I don't want to uh, editorialize here. This is for me to interview you, mm-hmm. but I just, I've not ever seen um, a great deal of evidence that these other beings, A, have really deep and profound loving emotions, or B, really are particularly concerned with elevating us into whatever uh, dimension they were, you know, I mean, there's a lot of folks out there who believe that this is what the, the plan is. And I've never, <laughs> I've never come across research that really makes me feel Yes, this this makes sense. I've just not done it. Whereas mm-hmm. when I uh, encounter abduction researchers like yourself, I've never f- ever felt, I've listened to you speak many, many times, and I've never ever gotten from you that you're pushing any agenda one way or the other. I've always felt you're very detached. And, you know, these beings that come through in the um, regressions that you're doing with your with your people... They do tell a consistent story, and I don't see how they're here for our benefit. I, I don't know that if they're here to, to harm us necessarily, but right. I, I certainly don't see how they're here for our benefit. I've not really gotten that. I don't know how persuaded I am that this the urgency is actually a real thing or not. I mean, on the one mm-hmm. hand, anyone looking around our world realizes we've got yeah. serious problems. So on that yeah. level, Yeah. There's an urgency to fix a lot of things. And our, our infrastructure, our civilization, it, it could be quite brittle, to be honest. So there is that logic to it. On the other hand, as far as I know, I mean, people have been getting these types of messages. Um, you know, even back in the 1950s, uh, contactees mm-hmm. were saying that, you know, the, the um, Space Brothers are warning us against nuclear proliferation right. and, and this type of thing. So I don't know if it's, is it really a new message or not? And I'm not. You know, if we've had this urgency, you you say in your research that it's a fairly new phenomenon. So that's the thing that stuck out with me. Well, it was, I mean, I, I know about the, you know, years past when they were claiming that they were getting messages. I, I only, from what my experience was, was hearing it from people over and over again for like, say, four solid years. Right. New people coming in, new people wanting to see me and make sense of what happened to them, if anything happened to them, um, because they were feeling that they were supposed to do something other than their current career and so forth. That's why I thought, you know, what's going on here? Um, and then I started feeling an anxiety when I started hearing, especially the report last night about, you know, we're in, in dire straits here with, what's going on in our planet. Oh, yeah. I just put it out there from what I have been learning, what right. you know, what people have been talking about uh, consciously and um, also in regression. So it's, uh, it's this kind of, uh, from what I recall in your book, folks, the people would be giving different types of scenarios that they're worried about. You, you yourself said, like, there's not a tremendous unified consistency to the messages, is there? The consistency is of people wanting to, wanting to and, and not knowing that they're supposed to do something. Like yeah. there, um, the one client that I mentioned who was making six figures and all, he started working on a, uh, a program to help the environment. I think it's, he's over in Europe now. Okay. Because he feels like, you know, he, he wasn't doing enough. And that's how that's what they're feeling. They're not doing what they're supposed to do. They're not doing enough. So in, something in, is in triggering. Different. Something's triggering a new attitude. Yeah. And one thing that I thought was pretty interesting was, you know, we heard in the past years, oh, the year 2000, you know, everything's going to blow up and computers and all that. Then it, then it was 2012. Right. You know. And nothing, you know, nothing's happened. And here, when I was hearing this from experiencers, no one gave or has given a specific date. If 
the hybrid project is integral and central to abduction cases, then, well, as David Jacobs and uh, Bob Hawkins argue, and I agree with them, there must be also positive relationship between uh, hybrid project and um, environmental crisis. It may be more or less assumed that the hybrid project is a response to this impending demise of human civilization. What we do not know at this stage is precisely how the, pre, uh, the project is a response to this crisis. Or perhaps aliens will never tell us and will never know about it. What they have said so far are only three short sentences. This is important. We must do it. We have the right to do so. The last scenario is we are, uh, or aliens are producing hybrids as a new species that will repopulate the Earth, but only after the Earth is left deserted for a certain period of time. The hybrids will be brought down to the Earth again when the Earth ecosystem regains ability to support advanced life again. And this scenario improves on the drawbacks of the previous two scenarios. But it is not without its own weakness. According to James Hansen, again, it takes 10 years for atmospheric methane to turn into CO2, and about one third of a carbon dioxide emission remains in the atmosphere after 100 years and one quarter still remain after 500 years. So therefore, it will take several hundred years or even several thousand years until the Earth ecosystem becomes clean again after the extinction of advanced life forms. But do the hybrids have such a long life expectancy? And where will they be staying while all these things are taking place on the Earth? Uh, spaceships look quite small, and I don't think they will be happy to stay there bumping into each other for an extended period of time. But there are solutions to these problems. While the Earth remains unable to support life, the hybrids can be relocated to another planet and proliferate there. Regardless of their life expectancy, they can maintain a sizable population through reproduction until the time is ripe on the Earth. Moreover, they have half-human gene, so what would all the genetic engineering have been about if they are not meant to come back to the Earth? So the third scenario has answers to all these questions. The real weakness is this. Why will they go through the hassle of remigration to the Earth when they have happily settled in their own world? I accept that this, is, this protest is quite reasonable, and it sounds all the more so, given that they have half human, sorry, alien genes that undoubtedly will assist them to assimilate to a different planetary environment. We have a very little hint about aliens' intention, and these three scenarios are equally all plausible, or for the same reason, equally implausible. Um, whichever scenarios uh, you might prefer, uh, they have all one common assumption, the impending demise of human civilization. One of the things that many, not all, but many abductees talk about from their human hybrid handlers is, is about some sort of coming great change. If you go back uh, on this channel and you uh, listen to the interview I did with uh, Dr. David Jacobs from a couple of years ago, he talks quite a bit about this. But a number of people have mentioned this, and, and from a number of different abduction researchers, not just David, uh, quite a few abductees have talked about this, that they have heard about this from the, the hubrids or the hybrids that they, that they have interacted with, that there's going to be a great change coming, a great change. No one gives any details. Uh, a lot of abductees report being shown images, whether on a screen or directly in their heads, of catastrophic cataclysmic events, the earth cracking or burning or, you know, environmental collapse, total utter disaster. And, uh, you know, you don't know if that's metaphorical, if it's a warning, if it's the concrete future, you know, and if the change or the integration is going to occur before then or after then or, or what. Uh, do you have any sense yourself as to what to make of those kinds of images? You know, I, uh, I, I have waxed and waned on this over the years. Years ago when I first began to hear this, I assumed that um, 
one of the things I looked at when people were seeing these images, oftentimes beings were staring into their eyes, and that still happens. And you know that there's sort of some neurological engagement that's going on. So my guess at that time was that in some way, and this was years ago, and I had no knowledge of how they were doing anything there, but I, my, I figured that they were examining people's reactions to these um, to these awful scenes of cataclysm and atomic war and the earth cracking in half and floods and all the rest. Um, and uh, so they were, they were, and my model was the experimenter learning model, you see, and, and so I thought that, that that's what they were looking at, were learning on how people react. But, you know, when you hear hundreds of these, after a while, it doesn't make any sense. They, they, you can figure out fairly quickly that people will be shocked or anxious or whatever it is. And um, uh, then I began to realize that, that other things might be at work here. And I used to think, well, uh, the content of what people are seeing is of no importance whatsoever. It's, uh, and, and, I, and that still may be true. But I now have a slightly different take on this. Uh, I think that, that this is more a neurologically based uh, set of images which are either reinforcing neural pathways or changing neural pathways. I think that what's happening here with these kinds of images has more to do with the neurology of the brain than something that is predictive about what is going to happen in the future. Now, having said that, in the future, something like this may happen. I, uh, I don't know. I, I hope not, obviously. And I I if that's the case, would this be in some way a signal, this is when the change will come? And if that's the case, would abductees then have a role to play that they are in some way being trained for? Because uh, the, there are many cases where people are acting out as uh, in, in a prescribed plan. They have to do this, that, this, that, in these images, uh, and and maybe it's it's part of a training uh, exercise, which would still be neurologically based, of course. Uh, so so I don't really know what all this means, but I have a sense that this is still part of the future and that it is a neurologically based uh, uh, aspect, perhaps, of training where where something will kick in when some event happens. That does seem to be a common theme also. A lot of abductees talk about being put in front of a console. They're being trained to operate alien equipment. Uh, a lot of them seem to have a sense that they do have a mission or a role to play in af during or after the change, whatever that is, as if they are indeed being programmed for a job or something. This does all seem to be pointing to uh, some, and, and also because it's, it's done with, with particular people right now. Uh, presumably, it's, it's training for some kind of event that's going to be in their lifetime, I, I would presume. I do think that this is going to be within the realm of, uh, of someone's lifetime who's alive now. Maybe not mine, uh, but, uh, but someone's lifetime. I, I do think so. I don't think that this is where we're very far off. Uh, I, I don't think 40 years from now is very far off, if that's the outermost limits, or even, even 50 or 60 years. And I recently <clears throat> excuse me, investigated a case in which um, a woman was shown, uh, had some interaction with some young children, children, uh, uh, old and toddlers, but children, uh, hybrid children, and she was told, that these particular children will be in in positions of authority, essentially, in in the, in your society. That these people will be important in your society. This is, uh, and um, I, I didn't want to hear that. I, I, I don't want to hear that. That he was indicating not generically people, but these these ones right here, which means it's in their lifetime, and that they have a normal human type lifetime. That's. And we don't know how old they're going to be. So I, I, I do think the indications that I've been getting, and this was just a, a session that I did two weeks ago, the sessions, are, the indications are that 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 this is something that that we might that we might live to see. In other words, and uh, um, so so uh, whatever happens, I, I I don't see happening somewhere in the in the distant future. Frankly, I hope it does happen in the distant future. And I, frankly, I hope it doesn't happen at all. But I hope that, that if it happens, it happens in in the very distant future, as distant as possible, uh, but that's not what, what people indicate to me, unfortunately. Now, from time to time, people are, are brought in to a room and their attention is directed to a screen-like device somewhere. Now, on the screen, and here is a screen-like device, uh, there might be any number of things to see. But you'll notice in this scene, I don't know if you can see it here, Here's somebody sitting on a ledge. He's drawn this uh, with sort of a breakaway uh, room. Uh, 
here he calls these guards. These are two small gray aliens. Here is another abductee sitting on this bench or ledge being looked at. Or ten, or she's tending two little kids. You can just see their hybrid garb that they're wearing there. Abductees do not wear clothes. You can always tell an abductee in the picture by the one who's not wearing clothes. And, uh, and here he is. And then he, uh, there's a screen. Now, what do people see on the screen? Well, they see uh, strange geometric shapes and colors floating slowly across the screen. That's unusual, but that's what they see sometimes. Sometimes they see burden scenes of wilderness, beautiful, wonderful. That's also unusual, that's what they see, but that's what they see sometimes. Sometimes they see normal everyday scenes of human life. And now we're going to jump right to the end here. And people will say, will say I'm seeing like, and I think I wrote about this in the thread, I'm seeing a picnic. There's people playing ball, they're at a grill, they're talking, this and that. Now, all communication on board the object is telepathic. In their mind's ear, they'll hear, at a picnic, let's just say, can you tell the difference between us and you? And they'll look at the screen and they'll say, um, uh, no, what, you know, they'll think, what are you talking about? Everybody is just a normal picnic. Everybody looks the same. People are having fun. And they'll say, see, isn't that wonderful? Isn't that great? Soon we will all be together. Soon everybody will be happy. Soon, uh, everyone will know his place. Soon, the change is coming. There's going to be a change. Everybody's going to be happy. Every, uh, we're, we're, you know, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. And what they're actually saying is, there's going to be a change coming, coming, and we, aliens and hybrids, are going to be happy that it's coming. You, we don't particularly care about. But we think it's wonderful. It's terrific. It's going to be wonderful. And they're not saying, they're saying just that, but when you read between the lines of these things, you realize they're talking about themselves. It's going to be, that's what they're here for. Now, you hear something like that once, and what you do is you put it on the back burner, you wait for confirmation from other people who are not aware of this testimony, and if it's never confirmed again, it's not evidence because you're looking for patterns. And well, after you hear it a number of times in similar ways, then you begin to think, wait a second, something is happening here. As we move forward... Here is another screen. Now, this is sort of interactive. This is actually a woman. I just said all abductees don't have any clothes on, and here's an exception. She said she was wearing her nightgown. Almost certainly not. But who am I to argue? Uh, so she's brought before a, a, this is a council. These are symbols or something on the council. And up here is an alien... I hope you can see that in the back. Being chased by a group of angry humans. And her job is to, in some way, put her hands here or with her mind or something like that, placing her hands here in appropriate... Oh, symbols. Yeah. The save. She's got to save. She's got to maneuver the UFO that she's on over the alien here to save him so he'll go up into it from the humans. And she said, well, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> I can't do that. And then she realized, she said, well, wait a second. Maybe I can. Maybe I can do that. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that. And she starts putting her hands here. And then you can see the, 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 she can see it's sort of moving, whatever the image she's looking at, uh, over this alien. There's obviously no alien with a group of humans chasing him there. And, um, and they say, oh, that's good, that's good. Thank you, very. That's good. very, very good. You did a good job. And they just take her away, and that's that. Now, the point here is that this is not very much different than playing with an object that has lights on it when you're a kid. And I began to understand that all this play, that, that stuff that I was looking at, lots of tons of play accounts, all had to do with training of the abductee to perform tasks, mentally or physically or whatever it was. And as an adult, they're still doing it. 
And in Secret Life, I called it testing. We didn't know what it was. I thought they were testing reflexes, testing this, testing how much you knew, whatever they were testing. Now I would change that word. I would call it training. This is all part of a training procedure. Okay, next. Now, sometimes we see hybrids who are older. This is a hybrid in his 20s. He was wearing glasses of some sort. Uh, I don't know whether this is true or not. Uh, both these uh, cases were, uh, were my colleague Bud Hopkins' cases. Here is another one wearing glasses, actually the same person, uh, seen by another abductee. But we have to be careful with this, but you can see he's got sort of a pointed chin, and uh, although everything looks pretty normal, blondish hair. Here's one that looks sort of like a hunk, wearing what might be called a uniform or something, uh, close cropped hair, uh, very large eyes, but looks quite, I call it late stage. A late stage hybrid looks quite human. Here's a middle stage hybrid. Now he's got this sort of one piece thing on. He's got this pointed chin, very wispy hair. This is the abductee. She is not wearing anything, although she thought she was, but, but later on confirmed she wasn't. This is actually, this thing he's pointing at on a screen is a road map. These are blocks. These are streets and so forth. These are houses, whatever it is. And, and he's telling her, in the future, your job will be to stand here, wherever it is, and tell people, to, it's okay, just move this way, just keep moving this way. They'll be panicked, they'll be frightened, but it's up to you to keep them in line. Just keep them moving this way, just keep them that way. That's her, that'll be her job in the future. And she's got to remember that that's going to be her job. She's got to move those people in this direction. I've got a number of them, lots of them, moving people. That's a very common aspect of what's going to happen in the future. There will be panicked people. Their job is to calm them and keep them moving in an orderly fashion. Do they ever, do the people that are doing the training, the aliens that are doing the training, do they ever use violence? if they're not getting their way? Yes. Um, now, violence to them is not violence for us, which is uh, shooting somebody, hurting somebody with a hammer. That, that they don't do. But there is a, a certain pathway to actually doing a form of violence. Uh, the pathway, there's only one thing that they're concerned with. That, In other words, when an abductee is helping a hybrid, it's not just the hybrid is alone. There's usually uh, a security hybrid who's overlooking sometimes the, the, the learning situations, not always, but there's a security hybrid who's attached to this particular hybrid's case. Uh, and there's also what I call a personal project hybrid who has been attached to the female or to a male but I've only seen it with females, for, for many years, oftentimes since they were children. And, uh, and they are, the two of them, the security hybrid and the personal project hybrid, are the protector of the hybrid who is, of the hubrid, let's put it that way, who's in the process of actually moving in. The only way that a person who's under control can violate something, the only way that they can do something that is against the rules, is to remember it and talk about it. That is the only thing that they're concerned about. That blows their cover. That means that bad things can happen. Maybe I can show up at her home with a shotgun one day, although it wouldn't help because I wouldn't be able to do anything since they would control me immediately. But uh, but it's they do not want it. This is a clandestine operation. This is not something, it's all done in secret. It's not something that they want anybody to know about ever. So. Um, what we see here is uh, people who simply keep, keep talking to me. And they tell them not to do it. They threaten them. They threaten me. Uh, sometimes those threats are, are fairly serious and got me uh, and got me in all sorts of trouble once. But, uh, but uh, you know, have you ever been personally threatened and you fear for your family? Yes, but only through abductee's testimony, not somebody coming up to me and me getting the impression that I, I better stop or anything like that, nothing like that. So eventually what happens is, is they can't get the person to stop. They can't do it. And I just keep doing sessions with them and doing sessions with them. And they can't get them to stop. And they, and they, they, do, they threaten everything. They scare the, the living hell out of them and all that. 
then uh, they resort ultimately to violence. It starts out with sexual violence, but they've had the sexual stuff all for years and years. There's, but it even can go to a certain amount of well, of cutting just to teach the person a, a, a lesson that heals up very quickly. But there's there's a cut and there's blood there originally. Then to things as off the wall as um, uh, sticking one's thumb into the bottom of a cheekbone and pressing real hard and has something going on there leaves is apparently it hurts whatever however they do it but there's no mark who would ever think of that of all things you know i've had a series i've had a whole bunch of people describe that what the heck you know i mean of all things to think of that that would not be the first thing that comes to my mind when you're thinking of violence that sounds like torture well, it's just they're inflicting pain, but there's no bruise. That's the whole point of it. Then um, there's um, uh, pushing a woman down backwards and then pulling them up by their hair. That I've seen a bunch of times. Uh, one woman who was uh, uh, a little overweight actually broke her wrist when she fell back to break her fall. So she woke up in the morning with a broken wrist. I asked I asked her how she, she, she hates one of my get-togethers, uh, and I, I asked her how she got that cast, and she said, well, how, how she, you know, she broke her wrist. I said, asked her what happened, said she broke her wrist. She said, well, how did that happen? She said she didn't know. Well, that's, that's not an answer. That's a correct answer. What do you mean you don't know? I mean, everybody who's ever broken their wrist knows exactly how it happened, unless they were too young, and then their parents know exactly how it happened. It's a trauma running through their, their minds. So, um, and the final one, is um and now this is good now everything is off the wall of course but uh but this one here has a resonance with us these in this day and age they take a woman or uh, take an abductee and they stick uh, her head i'm using her because the majority of my people are, are, are female they take her into the bathroom put her in the shower force her to lift her head up and then they turn the shower on and she, she thinks she's going to drown and they say next time we're gonna, you know, we're gonna, you're gonna get more. You are gonna draw, we're gonna, we're gonna, you know, that sort of stuff. Uh, and they do this uh, often, and or dunk a woman's head in water, and they do that, uh, that, and um, well, that's violence, and the way I look at it, <laughs> that's that's violence. How do you get and, your uh, patients to deal with this? Because as you said, uh, it's it's continual, it, it's it's ever present, and it's continual. Well, it's the worst thing is if they're still working with me. As soon as they stop working with me, then everything is equals out again. Then they don't have to. There's no violence. There's no nothing. Everything is fine. Uh, but they learn that. Um, well, th they're too precious to do any real damage to. Nothing is. I, that's the way I look at it, and that's, that's the way they they look at it too. They've been having this done to them since they were kids. Now, no violence or anything like that, but they've been have being a, a, abducted. Many, 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 many times, many times. And therefore, there's a lot of energy and uh, and thought placed uh, by these uh, aliens into them. And uh, there's a, and th these are prized people, so to speak, who will help these beings integrate into this society. So you can do a lot of things to them, but you can't kill them, so to speak. You can't do it to be just brutal about it. You can't do that. They're, they're but precious. You do you think just commodities. But once the hubrids are numerous enough to take over the planet, do you think we're on the extinction list? I I don't, don't know. My abductees have have talked about this when they've asked some questions of these beings. And uh a couple of them have brought up the idea that a small uh, group of um humans, they don't know how many would be kept uh, for breeding processes in case the, the hybrid program needs more uh, uh, human uh, sperm and eggs or whatever. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, however, um, I, 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 I look at the future and uh, I, I don't like it. Uh, I, I don't look forward to it with, uh, with, with what's, what's the next most wonderful, surprising thing that's going to happen. I, I, I did years ago when I thought this was the most amazing thing, and this is contact in some way, and these people are just examining us just like we would do with animals if we found them on another planet and all that sort of stuff. And then the more I got into it, the more I realized what was happening, I began to be fearful of it. And now I, I really fear the phenomenon. 
Uh, I I don't like it at all. I, I just I just don't see a happy ending to this. I, I just don't see it. Even if they keep humans around, we're second class species. You know, it, it's it's once you can control us, that's all you need. You can make us do anything you want, anything. And so uh, uh, I just for some reason or another, that's a little off putish to me. When people say, well, what kind of aliens are there? How many aliens are there? People said that there's 100 different kinds of aliens, 200, I have, five, I have 9 million different aliens. What the actual statistic is, is that what, the actual, what we actually see is there are very tall, very thin-looking aliens. People say, God, they look like a, a praying mantis. Yes, yes. Those are the ones in control. Within that praying mantis group, there's actually a, a hierarchy that we can see. There are some who, do, who now we come to crazy stuff, who actually wear some sort of cape or gown or robe or something or other that I would I laughed at when I first heard it. Now I hear it all the time and I realized, oh, I, now I understand. They are the ultimate ones who have the, who are in control of the hierarchy. There's a, it's gotta be a, there's a hierarchy of authority. There's gotta be, there has to be all sorts of different things that happen to it, have this program put in. That's a whole other talk, and that's another hour's worth of talking yes. that I could do in terms of, of how this program gets put into place. But um, then there are the regular <clears throat> insect-like ones, and eventually you get to uh, taller gray aliens, smaller gray aliens, and hybrids. And then some people say they see some that look like they're reptilian. Reptilian. They're, they're rep this one's like, oh, this one's ugly. He's look he's reptilian. Mm. So I've asked people to draw what a reptilian looks like. And when they draw it, they're all over the place. Some look like they're made of sort of like alligators. Some look like they've got scaly skin. Some look like they're aliens, just regular aliens. Uh, some look like, you know, there, there's, no, there's no set look for a reptilian. It's sort of a variety. I think that these are hybridization aspects that, that we're looking at, uh, that, that were offshoots or different for different reasons within this program. But so, I, but and they'll say, oh man, I, I, I don't like this. Oh, this reptilian is awful. He's horrible. He's terrible. He's scaring me. Oh, he's dreading. He's horrible. I say, well, what's he doing? What's, is, is, is he, you know, is he violent against you? No, no, no. Well, is he threatening you? No, no. Well, well, what's he doing? Well, I just don't like him. I just, he's horrible. He's horrible. He's terrible. <laughs> The bottom line is this. They're all seen together. They're all working in the same program. They're all abducting the same people. We see the reptilians every once in a while. It's a very, very, very small part of the abduction phenomenon. Mm. But we do see them. Uh, and that is all we see abducting humans. That is all. What I'm going to do tonight is talk about uh, some of the medical evidence uh, from UFO abduction encounters. Now, the thing here about some of the cases I'm going to tell you about is that we have not really adequately uh, investigated them. Some we have and some we haven't. One of the problems is, is that we need a profound expertise, medical expertise, to help us with these, ex uh, these experiences, to try to find out exactly what may lay, lie behind them. I wish that we had more precise evidence to back these things up, but what I'm going to show you are situations where there's already, already a medical mystery behind the situations in which many of these people find themselves after abduction experiences. I also want to point out that medical issues of some sort, which might, some of which are, are rather grave, as you will f learn, uh, these are thankfully very, very rare. Uh, just as you occasionally hear about a healing that takes place during an abduction, you sometimes hear about these cases where there is some kind of uh, medical problem that can be of a serious nature. Uh, but they're all, thank goodness, marginal. One of the things that's really interesting about this is that you will see some physical evidence, marks and so forth, and we'll go into uh, some of these cases at, at, in depth. But 
as an example of the way people tend to dismiss this subject. Uh, a man once said to me, and I, I love the quote, he said, uh, how can you go along with these, this sort of stuff? It's, it's just a cult. You people are in a cult. And I said, well, it's very interesting but, that you bring that up because it's the precise opposite of a cult. We have these physical marks, which you're going to see, which are repeated again and again and again in many, many hundreds of people. You're going to see scoop marks, cuts. You're going to find out issues about a disappearing ovary. You're going to find out many, many, many things which we do not know the purpose of. We have to explain. We don't know why these things are inflicted on people. We have some theories, but we don't really know. And I'm the first to say I don't know. But at any rate, we've got all of this physical evidence about which we have no clear, absolute idea of its purpose. And I said, the interesting thing to me is a cult, like let's say the Moonies, is a situation of all beliefs and no miracles. It's all an elaborate set of beliefs that you have to have about who um, the Mr. Mooney is himself, or whatever the term is and uh, what the theology is and so forth, but there are really no miracles. And we're in exactly the opposite situation. We have all these miracles, and we have no theory. We have no theology, as to, so to speak, of why these things are done. We have some ideas, some speculations, but we really don't know. So if you're in a situation where you have to judge between all beliefs and no miracles, or all miracles and no beliefs, I'm interested in the latter case because those are things that create genuine mysteries. Now, I want to start with the first slide. We can turn on the slides. Uh, I don't know whether I do it from here, okay. Uh, it's a little hard for me to see with the light. All right. I'm gonna deal first with uh, something that many of you people are very familiar with, which are the so-called scoop marks. This doesn't happen to every abductee, or maybe even one in 20. We don't really know. But many people, when they're taken, find themselves afterwards with a little depression, often in the front of the leg. Uh, they can appear in many different places. I've even seen them on the face. They can be very small. They can be very large. But it's as if a layer of cells has just simply been scooped out. They do not remember bleeding, they do not remember any kind of uh, pain for the most part. Uh, they just suddenly find themselves with this mark and there it is and they have no idea uh, what caused it. Now this first slide is, uh, shows um, Kathy Davis, I reproduced it a long time ago when I first got into the idea that these events were happening, these scoop marks are being made. Uh, this is in my book, uh, my book uh, Intruders. This is very difficult for me to see from here. Um, oh, here we go. Uh, this is what it looks like up close. Now you can see uh, the same thing on her leg. This is in the front of the shin. There's a little oval depression. And this is something she'd had on her leg for a long time. This is her mother's leg. She has one in exactly the same spot. And very often, uh, for instance, in one case, uh, three different young women we're in an automobile which was stopped, there was an abduction, and all three young women had scoop marks on their right ankles immediately after the event. We're not sure why. Uh, this is her mother's scoop mark seen up close. This is uh, one that you can see also in the same spot, on the front of the, uh, of the uh, lower leg. You don't see these very often. This isn't quite healed, but the point is there's no healing really that seems to be necessary really extensively. The person is returned, it can be a baby, and the baby is returned. The mother takes the little do Dr. Denton's off the baby and there are these marks. And nobody knows why, but we can certainly know for sure that a, a layer of cells has been removed from that child. Now this mark is, which is perfectly circular, is on a little boy, uh, five years old. And the interesting thing here is that his father had taken him to the doctor because he had a rash on his leg. And the doctor said, uh, here's some salve and so on and so forth. Come back in four or five days and we'll look at it again. He came back four or five days later and there was this scoop mark on the leg which the father had noticed 
that had occurred in the intervening five days, but it was totally healed. The doctor had no idea how it could have gotten there. He'd just seen it for the first time five days before. Now, this is a very rapid situation. This is a very small scoop mark at the front of the leg. We're going to go through this fairly quickly. Now, the, these uh, particular marks are close-ups, and you can see what happens uh, that the, the oval quality of these things suggests a certain kind of tool, and many people remember a small, almost like an ice cream scoop or something that slips in, although many people can't quite see it, because if they're lying horizontally on a table when this is done to them, uh, they can't really raise their head enough to see what's going on down there. Uh, but again and again, the same thing happens. Now, in these two pictures, the top one, which is a very large scoop mark, is on the right thigh, the outside of the thigh, of a man. This occurred in, uh, actually in Turkey. And he has one on the other leg in exactly the same spot, a symmetrical set. These are things which he noticed when he was a child, has no idea how they got there. His parents don't remember, there was no blood, there was no anything. The one at the bottom is very interesting because this is on the uh, shin, really, excuse me, the, the front, the shin of the lower leg of Peter Curie. Now, I don't know whether you're familiar with the Peter Curie case. I was just in Australia and it's an extremely important case. Peter Curie was an abductee. He's of Lebanese background, living in Australia. And in this case, which is now quite well known, he was awakened. He's been through a lot of other experiences. He was awakened, and there were two females in the room with him, one sitting on him, uh, a very strange-looking woman with hair that didn't quite look human. And um, he was totally frightened, and she pulled him up towards her. He pushed her back as best he could. He found her incredibly strong. Uh, the other woman he thought was observing to see what this connection was going to be, perhaps sexual, we didn't know. Um, ultimately, when this thing ended, when he uh, didn't remember what happened next, uh, he woke up later and there was a hair, a long blonde hair, uh, which was, he, fa he found in a fairly embarrassing place in his body. The hair has been analyzed. Um, there is a, um, a Nobelist in Australia who does work with genetics and uh, studying the DNA of this hair, and it, it, is, it is extremely unusual. But at any rate, that mark on Peter's leg comes from a totally different experience. And there's one little detail about the experience when this apparently turned up that I find very touching, very real, very bizarre. He showed me in his house uh, where uh, at, the, at the foot of the bed there's about a 10 foot space and then there are these long folding uh, doors which have uh, the closet which have mirrored surfaces. He remembered at one point waking up, wake, waking up being lifted off the bed small figures were coming towards him through the mirror. And he thought there are lots of them until he realized he was looking at them from the front and seeing their reflections in the mirror, which doubled the number of aliens in the room. He remembered being floated towards this mirror. That's that ability to float people through. However this is done, we have no idea, through a closed surface. And he said he remembers as he was getting closer to the mirror, he, his head was up just a little bit, and he could see this terif terrifying face staring at him and realized it was his face in the mirror as he was going through it. And he said as he passed through the glass, he felt as if he was going through some kind of gelatinous substance. Sometimes people re describe this sort of thing when they pass through a surface, sometimes they don't. Uh, I know all this sounds totally impossible, but we get this again and again and again. Now this particular case, and I'll just go through this rather quickly, and then we're going to get into some of the more, uh, more imposing and more upsetting uh, medical cases. This uh, scar is uh, on a man's back, as you can see. The man is an artist, uh, an acquaintance of mine, he's an African American. And the story of this is in itself very interesting. Uh, he came to my house once, I'll make this brief, came to my house once and uh, uh, on an art issue and uh, he said, you know, but I, th I think I saw you on television the other night 
and my heart sank because I wanted to keep this on an art level. And he said, what is it that you do? And I sort of muttered something about UFO research. And how do you know this happens, he said. And I said, well, there are marks, there are cuts. And, so. and he said, well, I had this strange cut. And um, I said, how did you get this cut? And he said, well, that's the thing I don't know. I was a little boy. I was about 10, and I was on my bicycle. I went into the park near his house in the Middle West. And he said, I don't know what happened, but I remember it was daytime. I remember I was in a big white space, a big white room. I don't know where it was, and I was lying down. That's all I remember. The next thing I was walking my bicycle home, I got home very late for dinner. My grandmother yelled at me and so on. And she looked at my back at some point, and he said she found a couple of drops of blood on his T-shirt. Now, when you look at this, um, cut, I mean, it's about that long. A couple of drops of blood just is extraordinary. And she said, you've cut yourself, it's a terrible cut, how did this happen? And he said to, to her, and he said this to me, I told her I cut myself when I fell off my bicycle, but when I said that, I was thinking, I don't remember falling off my bicycle. There was no tear in the shirt, there was no dirt on him, the bicycle was fine. And that was the end of that. Um, it healed, and he's had that thing for 40-some years. Now, he said that he, the, thing, the situation tormented him, and he would go back to this park again and again and again, trying to find the white place where he was. He made no connection with UFOs. And actually, when we finally began to think maybe something happened here, and I interviewed him at some length, and a few days later, weeks later, we did hypnosis, and he remembered that he was taken in from the spark into the craft, put on a table, and cut. Um, he said that uh, afterwards he was just stunned and so on and so forth. And his wife said, thank goodness we know what happened. Now we won't have to go back to that damn park every time we go back to his hometown <laughs> looking for that white room. He didn't know. Now, now this particular cut, again, and as I say, we'll go through these fairly quickly. This is a woman who uh, has had a number of experiences. Uh, when this photograph was taken, uh, she had uh, gone to bed. She had a friend visiting. She woke up in the middle of the night. She had a recollection of hands pushing her down. That's all she could remember. And then she came to herself and was back in bed. And. Uh, her friend noticed this in the morning on her back, and um, she had no idea how this had happened. Now, what you're seeing in this is a dark bruise, but then down the middle is a straight line cut. Um, she had no idea what happened. There was no blood anywhere, none on her nightgown, none on the floor, none on the, where she remembered being pushed down, none on the sheets or anything. She went to a doctor. That photograph was taken two days afterwards, as I said, when she was taken to the doctor, and the doctor asked her what kind of surgery she had had. And she said, I didn't have any surgery, I just woke up and there it was. And he said, no, that's a surgical cut. What happened? Now, again, in Australia, and this is a worldwide phenomenon, we've already visited uh, in terms of, of scoop marks and cuts and so forth, uh, Turkey, and now this is Australia, again. Uh, and I should point out that the basic kinds of marks that we find, uh, even though there are sets of bruises, people find fingerprints and hand marks which fade away and so on after these experiences, so there's nothing terribly mysterious about them. But uh, in terms of, of um, these long-lasting things, they're either the round scoop mark, oval scoop mark, or a straight line cut. Now, in this particular case, this woman has a, a long cut with a, kind of a dimple in it. This is something that happened to her. She's a nurse in Australia when she was a tiny baby and in the hospital. And when she was taken home, it was there on her leg, and her parents didn't know what to make of it and never asked, raised any questions. She has a whole history of experiences. In many of these cases, I have to say, the person remembers something about the circumstances of the night or the time that these things turned up on their body, and very often they don't. They just notice it. And in one case, with a scoop mark, a man told me he was about 16 when he noticed this round scoop mark on his leg. It's not one of the things I have a photograph of. 
And he said he stared at it and stared at it and stared at it. And it so terrified him that he said he never wanted anybody to ever see it. He would wear long pants instead of shorts. He didn't know why he was hiding it, but he knew there was something dreadful about this mark on him. It took years and years before you know, the patterns became a little clearer to him and he began to putting, th put, putting things together. Now, uh, a close-up of this shows uh, it's quite disfiguring, it's quite deep. I have um, a photograph which is extremely similar of a woman from Great Britain who has the same kind of mark at the same place on her thigh. Now, again, I want to reiterate, we do not know why they do this. We do not know why they want this level of flesh. But these are permanent marks that baffle, baffle the doctors. When we deal, dealt with those scoop marks at the beginning, one doctor who looked at them said to me, they look like the marks you get from a punch biopsy. Did this person ever have a punch biopsy? And I said, no, these are people who had no idea how they got these things. Um, when some of these cuts are there, they're, they're, they seem quite dramatic. People will say, do you remember, does the person remember how they got cut, how this thing turned up? No, they don't. They don't even remember often how it happens. And I mentioned this one incident that I find very interesting. Um, in England, uh, I was giving a talk and I'm showing some slides about this. And a woman came up to me afterwards and she was a woman in her 60s. She was the wife of a police inspector, a very respectable English woman. And uh, she had remembered some conscious abduction experiences. Uh, and she actually was a speaker at this very small conference many years ago in Leeds. And um, she said, you know, uh, Bud, when you show those pictures of scoop marks, I have one of those on my thigh, more or less in the same place, on the right thigh. And uh, except was, this was a scoop mark rather than that straight line kind of thing. She hiked up her skirts. I didn't ask her to, but that's what happened. And there was this very large scoop mark, size of my thumbnail, well, of a certain depth. And I said, well, and it was actually a rather ugly thing. Uh, it's the kind of thing that this woman has never been in a bathing suit with friends where somebody didn't say, what happened to your leg? I mean, this, these aren't just little brushes with uh, some kind of a, uh, a briar someplace. These are really very clear and very precise. And I said, how did you get this? And she said, well, I know how I got it. I was out in the garden gardening and she said, an earwig ran up my leg and bit me. Now, if you remember what an earwig is, it's a beetle-like thing and it has pinchers on the back. And I said, um, I didn't know that earwigs bit people. And she said, I didn't either. I said, must have hurt. Oh no, I didn't feel anything. And I said, oh, you didn't feel anything? No. And I said, well, it must have really bled. That's a big piece of flesh you, you lost there. She said, oh, no, it didn't bleed. And I said, did you kill the earwig? And she said, no, I don't remember ever seeing the earwig. <laughs> and I said, well, how do you know an earwig ran up your leg? And she said, I, I just, uh, I've always thought there was, and then she said, this isn't making any sense, is it? <laughs> and I said, no, it isn't. And that's very typical of UFO experiences. Again, we don't know what, how this happened, why, but it is totally a medical mystery. These are not just casual things. What are they doing? Why? We do not know. But we have here what I regard as very, very serious, telling physical evidence that these are not people's imaginations or stories or whatnot. They leave behind them physical traces, which are visible, medical anal uh, uh, anomalies, which have really a great deal of mystery about them. And we need to look into these very, very seriously. We need medical help.